Let's look to the Lord. Gracious God, we are just so thankful that we get to come into this space in the midst of the rain and in the midst of our and we get a chance just to talk to you, just to speak to you. Thank you for your word that speaks and gives life to us. Thank you that we get to congregate here and just abide in your presence. And so now, Lord, I just pray that fill this room with your presence. Just quiet everything else down, Lord. The things that have been distracting, the things that are just, might even be the burdens that we're carrying. And, and just allow the spirit of the living God to speak to us. We trekked out through the rain. We came here, but we, and we want to see people, but we want to meet with you. So speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, you know, you've been tracking with us in the book of Solomon prayerfully and you know, Solomon wants you to become more wise, wants you to make better decisions for your life. He wants you to not have to learn life through just experiences, but he wants to speak a word over your life. This book is intended for younger people to be able to make wise choices. One of the things that Solomon is really trying to teach is that life that is happening to you, life that's happening around you, the things that are happening outside of you is a portion of your life. In other words, many of you are working on goals. You're trying to get into jobs. You're wanting to build relationships. And those are very important. But here's what Solomon is going to try to get at today. What is happening on the inside of you is far more important than what's happening on the outside of you. How you are taking inventory how you are processing, how you are thinking about what you're going through is more important than what you're going through. That is what Solomon wants to teach you. We get caught up. Right? We compartmentalize. And we just kind of work our way through the day. We kind of fight towards the next goal. We kind of make our way to work. All the while, we have so many things going on inside of us. We are complex beings. When someone asks you how you're doing, sometimes that can be a hard question to answer because you're not just one thing. Are you happy? Yes, but you're also a little confused. You're also a little sad. And you can start the day off one way and end the day a completely different way. We are layered beings. And so because of that, we have to take time to figure out, how am I doing? How do I feel? How has that affected me? Those questions are key because wise people are not merely intelligent. They're introspective. Yes. They consider not just great thoughts, but they meditate on things. They meditate on their world. And they have a level of self-awareness about surroundings and how their surroundings are affecting them. What is then the danger? The danger is to go from one goal to the next, one opportunity to the next, achieve more and more. All the while, there's a level of brokenness, heaviness, tragedy, pain that you're carrying on inside of you, and you just keep enduring, keep fighting. And it will affect your relationships and it will affect your life. So today, Solomon wants you to pay attention to what's happening inside of you. Amen? Proverbs 18 and 14. Proverbs 18 and 14. Proverbs 18 and 14. It says, A man's spirit will endure sickness, but a crushed spirit who can bear? Now, that word spirit there, it's the same word we get for wind. The idea of spirit, he's not talking about the Holy Spirit. Talking about, uh, he's talking about someone's vitality, their energy, the vibe they give off, right? The spirit, the spirit of a person. That's what he's talking about. And the word wind there is this idea that there's this energy inside of you that you have a healthy spirit, a vital spirit. But he's talking about a crushed spirit, the potential of having a crushed spirit. When, uh, when I was growing up, Josh, just give me a timer, yep. Um, when I was growing up, 
I, uh, we didn't have phones, amen? So we actually had to go outside. And uh, when, we, when, we had, when we went outside, we didn't talk about phones. You know what the big thing for us was? Bikes, right? And uh, those of the Blessed Generation X, we had this thing called a mongoose bike, right? That was a big deal. If you had a mongoose, you had to be there. Anyway, there we had a mongoose. And, and this bike, right, we would, we would do, you know, we would do all these different tricks on the bike. But the, 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 you know, the big moment was when you'd make a right? So there to be, do I need to switch out? Okay. More and more and more. I did not consider how big I was, amen. And so I did the ramp, and then as I did it, I fall back, boom, and I fall back on my back. Now, who remembers the first time you got the wind knocked out of you? Do you remember that moment? You were like, I'm dead, right? I'm about to die. I'm 12. My mom is going to miss me, right? Well, when I fell back, oh, all the wind gets knocked out, and you just you're just fighting to get the air back, right? You get up and you feel like you're crazy, right? When he talks about a crushed spirit, he's saying that something happened to you that, boom, knocked the wind out of you. Took all your vitality, boom, took all your energy, boom, sapped you of life. That there was somebody you thought would come through for you and they didn't, and boom, it just... It was a gut punch. And now you're a little depressed. Now you're listless. Now you are discouraged. And it has hit you so hard. But this is, what, now th this is what the proverb is saying, though, and this is the thing that you've got to understand. It says a man's spirit will endure sickness. And it's talking about how people can fight through physical pain or physical sickness. New York City is the hardest place to have a physical ailment. When I see somebody on the subway with like a boot on, I just lift my hands and just say, Father, right now, just, I just bless them. Because to walk around this city with an injury or if you have to have crutches or praise God for those people on the scooter with their leg up and all that, I just bless you for all the things that you have to do. But you know what? This is a tough city. People are gritty, and you know what they say? I got to do what I got to do. I got to go to work. Ain't nobody going to cry for me. I got to go. I got nobody else going to pay my rent. I got to go, right? I got to fight through. And one of the things that you see is people can endure incredible things physically. But the problem, what Proverbs is saying is, you think the same kind of way that you endure things physically, you can do it emotionally and spiritually. And he's saying, you cannot. You can fight. You can keep going to work. But you cannot endure in that same way. And right now, some of you have been gut punched in life. But no one knows it. You look great. And no one can see how you've really been hit by disappointment, discouragement. Check, check. How the check. expectations you had really didn't come through. And really, you're still trying to catch your breath. And there can be a tendency for us to just, like the person in the subway, just, I got to grit through it. You grit through those emotions. You grit through that depression. You grit through that despondency and say, I'll just fight through it. I'll just suck it up. I will compartmentalize my life and move on instead of actually working through it. Here, Paul, the apostle, is encouraging the same idea in Ephesians chapter 3. In Ephesians 3, one of the things you should keep in mind is in Ephesians chapter 3, 
There are people in the Ephesian church in the, in the city of Ephesus, their families are literally being in their homes. There are all types of issues happening with the civil magistrate. The Roman Empire is sacking families and they're being persecuted. And yet, this is Paul's prayer, Philippians, um, Ephesians 3. He says, for this reason I bow my knee before the Father from whom every family in heaven on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory that he may grant to you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. Look at his prayer, that you'd be strengthened with power in your inner man, that you'd have a strong inner man. He doesn't even mention anything about civil magistrates. He doesn't mention anything about what's happening in Ephesus. He mentions what's happening inside of you and that he wants you to feel powerful on the inside. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, he says, be strong in the Lord. That's about having an inner man that's strong, even if the civil magistrates come. A strong inner man. And my fear is that this city just puts pressure on you to look externally great. That social media, I, I cannot tell you how many people I judged based on social media, like, you must be doing great. And then I sit down with them, like, that whole, your whole feed is untrue. You really are not what you look like, right? Like, look is so big for our culture right now. To be seen, to seem like life is a certain way, but it's not. And the energy that our whole world puts off is just, just fight to look away. And that journey on the inside is challenging, but you can have so much fullness. I was telling the congregation the service before this, uh, my wife used to coach basketball. Uh, she coached, and they ended up going to the state championship. She was a really good coach. And this was in Denton, Texas. And I was in seminary. So at the time, we were making about $28,000, about 2003. At the time, we thought we were rich. But as time went on, you know, bills start adding up. And we walked into service one day. I was uh, one of the preachers at this, like, campus ministry. We walked into service one day, and before we walked in, my wife said, Honey, we only have $100 in our bank account. And she was like, I just don't know where the money is going to come from. And so we walked into service, and what was crazy was because of our personalities, everybody's coming up to us like, oh, we're like, yeah, how you doing? We're shaking hands and hugging people, and we're praising God and all this. And then, and then we were sitting down during worship, and there was a song that was just saying, when you don't know what else to say, say the name of Jesus. And I remember, I remember sitting down with my wife, putting my arm around her, and I remember we just lifted up our hands, and we just began to sing, and we began to worship, and we began to seek God's face. And we walked out of there, and we were like, God is going to provide. And we had so much joy, and we had so much excitement about what, was, what God was going to do. Now, what we'd like to do is say, that Sunday we were filled with joy, and then on Monday we got a check for $10,000, and you get a check, and you get a check. Look under your seat. Like, that we want that kind of service. That's not what happened. Monday we had $100 in the account. But we had a small account, but a full heart. And why is that so important? Because our joy did not come from the resources on earth. Our joy came from our source in heaven. And why is that important? Because we have more than $100 in our account. We're not doing that well, but we have more than $100 today. But our joy has never come from a bank account. Our joy has come from the Lord. Spiritually invest. Spiritually invest right now. 
Make a decision right now in your life to make your internal investment the most important investment of your life. Some of you came into this year and said, I'm going to get physically fit. I hope you look great. You can look great on the outside but feel horrible on the inside. You say, I'm going to make this amount of money this year. You can make all the money in the world, but you will feel horrible on the inside. I'm telling you, another zero onto your bank account cannot fill your heart. It will not satisfy you. And that is Solomon's major point. We must take inventory about what's happening inside of us. And we must invite God into wherever we are. What happens when we don't take into account of our internal world? Well, Solomon hits at this idea that there are effects. He says here in Proverbs 14 and 30, a tranquil heart gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. Now look at what Solomon is trying to get at. A tranquil heart is a heart that's healthy and full, a heart that's being fed. But he says envy. Now that word for envy is a very nuanced word because it doesn't just mean having a, a, a desire for somebody else's stuff. The word can also mean passion or zeal. The word literally means a hot feeling. He's talking about an intense feeling that you have that could be like anger and passion. And what he's saying is there have been things that you have had happen to you in your life, things that you wanted to see, and those emotions are hot intense inside you. And he says, if you don't address those hot emotions, those anger and passion and envy, if you don't address that, it will rot your bones. He's saying it will have a physical effect on you. What he's talking about are what they would call psychosomatic disease. It can be arthritis. It could be headaches. It could be tense, in, uh, uh, your shoulders being tense. It could be obesity. All these things can be a byproduct of you having something happen in your life and it physically affects you. In the book, The Body Keeps the Score, Bessel A. van der Kolk says this, trauma victims cannot recover until they become familiar with and befriend the sensations in their bodies. Being frightened means that you live in a body that is always on guard. Angry people live in angry bodies. The bodies of child abuse victims are tense and defensive until they find a way to relax and feel safe. In order to change, people need to become aware of their sensations and the way that their bodies interact with the world around them. Physical self Awareness is the first step in releasing the tyranny of the past. So look at what she's getting at, or that they're getting at, is there is a reality to what you've been through and the physical effects that it can ha have happen on you and the anger and the stress that we see. So many of uh, my own family members have, have died because of heart disease. They've died because of stress in many ways. I believe that is directly correlated to the oppression that they had to work through. But here's the beautiful thing. Now, my, my mom, my dad, and many of your parents did not have enough bandwidth or room in their life to actually ask you how you feel. In other words, your feelings didn't matter. Get good grades. Ah, I feel depressed. Depress them dishes, right? That kind of thing, <laughs> right? Like, the, so your feelings really weren't, they didn't matter. What matters was accomplishments, achievements, because your family came from a survival culture where being outside was a challenge for them. Just getting over, immigrating over here, moving away from pain, like physical pain was a challenge. But because of their sacrifice, we now have an opportunity to take time to consider what we've been through. We now have space to consider what we've been through. So now that we have been afforded that opportunity because of their sacrifice, 
Let's not just live for materialism and live to have another office space or another relationship. Let's actually heal. Why don't we make that a goal? Why don't we talk through what happened in our family? Why don't we take time to investigate why we hold anger so much? Why don't we navigate some of those seasons of our life where we were lonely, but you had all these people around you, but you still felt lonely, but you need to investigate that season. I'm not saying do that alone. I'm saying allow God, allow therapists, allow healthy friendships to navigate that with you so that you can be healthy emotionally. We cannot have just financial goals as a means of success. We want to be healthy families, healthy people, full hearts, and the physical effects are real. Another consequence is what it says in Proverbs 28 and 1. It says, the wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are Bold as a lion. Really interesting verse here. Because what the Proverbs is saying is, uh, one, Solomon is hearkening back to Leviticus 26, where God says, if you don't disobey me, you will flee, and no one pursues. So I want you to just think about what he's talking about there. What, what he's saying is that a person is literally running from a perceived captor, but there's actually no one coming after them. They feel guilty about something, and they feel like that guilt is actually following them. <laughs> the truth of the matter is that guilt has a way of trailing after you and pursuing you, and making you run from something when really nothing is coming after you. When you feel guilty, you don't feel free. You are guilty before you're guilty. That's what guilt is. It's the emotion of knowing I am not living with integrity. I'm not living as I'm supposed to be. And it's hard work. Lying is hard work. I was telling the last, you know, in the congregation, has not New York City recently become aware of leaders being exposed, amen? Right? Of things that were done in the dark, now coming to the light. And here's the truth. We think, ah, you've been caught. Now, see, you, you're guilty. But here's the thing. Anybody in here that has any level of integrity, you've probably lost some trust, right, because of what has happened. And you've lost trust because of the things that you now know that are in, I'm talking about the mayor, praise God, if you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm talking about the mayor, I'm talking about the indictment, and I'm talking about what has allegedly happened, okay? I'm talking about Turkish planes and all that. <laughs> and and what, I'm, what I'm saying is, all this came out, and we're like, look at, look at that. Now, I'm not talking, whether he ends up staying the mayor or not, I, I'm not really getting into all that. What I'm getting at is this. When you have to do things to cover up, cover up is half the work. And I don't know if you've lost trust in him, but before he got exposed, he had already lost trust in himself. You see, when it says the righteous are as bold as a lion, what makes somebody bold isn't just the fact that they're competent in something. What makes someone bold is that they believe themselves. <laughs> and what makes people not sound authentic is they don't believe what they're saying. And when a person is bold, it's really because they actually trust themselves. And so the key to becoming more confident is really not just confidence, it's confession. 
It's being honest. Right now, some of you are hiding things and you're just trying to work through it. And I'm saying, (laughs) and that guilt is following you. And this happens sometimes when I preach. I'll be preaching, I'm like, you know, because we need integrity on the job. People will be like, And they'll be like, Pastor, okay, who told you? I'm like, nobody, you know what that was? That was the Holy Ghost. That was conviction. You feel convicted about something you're guilty about. And we want, we want to always let conviction in. And we want to let con- confession out. So that we can be the kind of people that God has called us to be. And if not, you'll be running with guilt and shame and you'll be fragile. There are people that I've had to redirect. I've had to say, hey, can you stop doing this? And they just get so emotional. I'm like, oh, what? I was just talking, I was just saying clean up after yourself. And you can tell there's actually something more happening. There's a level of fragility that you have in your life. There's a sensitivity that you have going on right now in your life. There's a level of fear that you walk around with. And it's not because someone is chasing you down. It's because it's your conscience coming after you because you don't feel free. That's happening on the inside of you, and you need to be released. You need to release that by having an honest conversation with God and others. And if you don't release it, you'll never feel free. You'll never feel bold. You'll never feel like an honest and real person. You'll never truly trust yourself. Here, there's some soberness to what's happening on the inside of us. The soberness is Proverbs 14 and 10. It says, each heart knows its own bitterness, and no one else can share its joy. Where Solomon gets at, it's like, hey, you, you've got things going on inside of you. It's affecting your body. You've got things going on inside of you. It's affecting your conscience. But he's also saying there's a, there's a reality. There are things that are happening inside of you that only you know. And that no one can actually fully understand except you. And you know what's the crazy part? My point in saying this is that there are things that people are not going to fully understand that's happening inside of you. But what's crazy is there's things happening inside of you that you don't fully understand. That you're trying to figure out. That you're curious about. And what he's saying here is each heart knows its own bitterness. There's a story that's happened in your world in your past, your own unique journey. And only you know it. We weren't there with your mom, with your dad. We weren't there on that job. We didn't experience the trauma that you had. You can tell us the story and we can share and we can conversate, but only you know that. And here is the soberness that he says. And no one else actually can share the joy either. That there are things that you feel exhilarant about, that you feel excited about, that we really can't fully celebrate, that we can't fully enjoy together. This is a very healthy proverb, y'all. Because there is a lie that there is a human that can fully appreciate you. You know what? They, I, they, they, they re- I need them to really get me. And I'm going to get at this in the next, the, the next to last proverb, but that is what we constantly do, is we think there is someone made of flesh and blood that can really complete my heart. You know, is it somebody, oh man, I wish I had some, uh, there was just somebody I could celebrate with, somebody I could laugh with, somebody that it gets me. Somebody I could just explain my world to. And yes, we need community. And at this church, we sell you on community all day. But a broken community. Not one that can fulfill you completely. 
I'd be rich if I told you the amount of people that came into the church and end up leaving the church because like, I really never found the, my, you know, my people. And I was like, well, if you define yourself as broken, you found your people. <laughs> They're all broken. I think you were trying to find a niche. And I get that. I, I get that. Everybody's, everybody's different. But, but here, this is, there's a level of loneliness we're always going to have. That's a fact. There's a level of sharedness we'll never have from people. There's a level of expectation we have to lower on humans. And this is where Solomon says in Proverbs 13 and 12, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. So look what he says, hope deferred, it does something to the heart. Hope, heart, always connected. This is why. Our hearts are always longing to hope in something. It does not stay still. Our hearts are navigational. It's directional. It has to attach itself to something. It will not be satisfied on its own. It always is looking for something. And so throughout our days, throughout our weeks, throughout our lives, even today, there's always something that we're saying in our hearts. If I had this, I'd be completely filled up. I'd have a better life. I'd be, I'd be totally fine. If I could just get this one thing. I mean, let's be honest. Our church is single, amen? And, there, and, and listen, I do marriage counseling, and I counsel single people. And the craziest thing is when I have a counseling appointment back to back, and they got the same problem. The single people are like, I'm lonely. Married person, I'm lonely. I'm like, we both lonely. But someone's lonely just in a house with someone else. Oh, they're not meeting my expectations. I thought when we got married, I thought this person was going to be all these different things. And they come to find out they married a very broken person. And the truth of the matter is that's not just for marriage. That's not just boyfriend, girlfriend. It's, we do that on our jobs. We, you go out to lunch with somebody, like, tell me about your job. Like, oh, man, at my job, they let us have as many cookies as we want, and it's amazing, and we get to wear flip-flops and Crocs and amazing. And you're like, oh, my gosh. If I could just get cookies on my job, <laughs> and if I could wear flip-flops, and oh, Lord, I, I'm looking at my Crocs. I want to wear Crocs, too. And, the whole, and then the rest of the week, you'd be like, I wish I had a Croc-wearing job. And you look, at, you look over at your job, you're like, we ain't got no cookies. And that's what, and, you'll, and the whole week, you'll be like, I need, some, I need a cookie-having job. I need to wear some. And, you're, and I'm telling you, what I'm telling you is, this is not just a thing. This is something that is always percolating inside of us. We're always trying to make human things last. We're trying to make people and jobs and money and cars and clothes and looks. We're trying to make them fill our hearts. And here's the craziest thing. We get the job. We eat the cookies. We wear the Crocs. And that Croc-wearing, cookie-having job, guess what you find out? It's a job. It's still a job. And the first few months are great. And then it's like, ah, this is work. And everything on earth is broken. And here's what he says, it makes your heart sick. Hope deferred. When you attach your heart to something that was not made to fill your heart, it defers your hope. And so what Solomon is getting at is like, you gotta be very careful of what you're doing that with. So we're always doing that. You're doing that regularly. And so what he says lastly is, a, des a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. You know, in the Bible, it, it talks about a tree of life in Genesis 3. I'm sorry, in Genesis 2. You know, the, the story of Adam and Eve is a story of trees. And the Lord says, hey, 
you can have all these trees, and you can have all these trees, and you can have all these trees. And mind you, there's another tree you could have, and it's a tree of life. Look here in Genesis 2.9. It says, out of the ground the Lord God made to spring every tree that is pleasant to the sight. Notice that. Pleasant to the sight and good for food. So every tree was pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So there is this tree, and if you know the story, God says, hey, I made a forest for you. It's got a lot of good stuff that all looks good. Just don't have this one. And Eve gets tempted. And what the Bible says in Genesis 3 and 6 is, so when the woman, now notice there, uh, back in Genesis 2, it talks about that tree of life. The tree of life is symbolic of something that sustains you, something that is healthy, something that is good for you. Amidst all those trees. But in Genesis 3, 6, it says, the woman, notice what it says, the woman saw that the fruit was good. If you look back in Genesis 2, it said the others were good too. It, it says it was pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom. So she took some and ate and gave it to her husband. It says it was a delight to her eyes. And what was happening to Eve is she started looking around that forest she started saying, man, there's this one thing I don't have, and God said don't have it. And Satan starts going, shh, if you had this one thing, life would be great. And I know in her side of her head, it's like, I know, but God said I got a forest. You got a forest, but he knows if you had this one tree, your life would really be right got to have this one thing. And Satan begins to market and trump up this one thing she doesn't have so that she might ignore all that she doesn't have or all that she does have. And all of a sudden she goes, I got to have that one thing. I got to have that. And then she goes beyond what God says to do. what she needed, what she needed was to stop and go, Lord, can you remind me of what I have? Lord, can you just give me some fresh perspective because this tree is looking really good right now. And the Lord would say, no, no, boo, look at this forest. Or Adam, that would have been nice. If Adam said, no, 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 remember, we have all this. was her eyes. She began to gaze and look. And right now, right now, you are gazing at something. You're looking at something. You're turning it into something it's never intended to be. You're turning romance into something it was never meant to be. It can never do. Money, jobs, looks, we're turning those things into things that are, that are trying to fill our hearts, and they will never fill our hearts. And I'm telling you right now, the second you walk out of here, Satan's got a story, and he's selling you on it, and he's telling you, I heard what that preacher said, but he don't know what he's talking about. I'm telling you. Look, look at all them. Look at all them. They're enjoying life because they have that one thing. And so we have to pay attention to what's happening on the inside pray that the Holy Spirit would give you an observation today to become aware of what is, what, where are my eyes going to right now? What have I been paying attention to? And that you would find your satisfaction in him and him alone. Father, today we ask that your spirit would guide us and lead us. Father, we pray I pray for the one, Lord, that 
as I was talking about confession. There's someone here today that has things that are bound in them. Guilt bound in them. Shame is bound in them. And they long to be free. Lord, I pray that they would have a fresh start with you today. I pray for the one that their eyes have been wandering and gazing at all types of things. And yet, they have forsaken their first love. God, I pray that we would come back to you, come back to you fresh. That we would turn from sin and turn to you. And we would seek your face above all else. I pray for the one that is being distracted by their desires. And I pray, God, that we would have a soberness to come back to you. And we would invite you into wherever we're at. In Jesus' name, amen. I wonder if you'd stand with me.